first of all, thank you so much for coming in today, sir. I, I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Um, I, I, I want to jump right on in, but uh, the only reason Collider gets to be at the Toronto Film Festival is because of our sponsors. It's expensive to cover these things. I want to give a huge thank you to Nordstrom Canada for being a great sponsor and allowing us to cover this amazing festival. Um, and thank you, Nordstrom Canada. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Deakins, uh, I just want to start by saying uh, uh, congratulations on um, winning uh, for Blade Runner 2049, some small award that uh, they give out to... Uh, very talented cinematographers. I want to start with that. Thank you. <laughs> it was. Uh, it, I, were you aware of everyone? So many people like rooting for you to win. Uh, I guess I was. Yes, probably. Yes. Okay. No, I'm just saying. Um, I, I thought your work on that film was absolutely brilliant. And one of the things uh, I want to get into Goldfinch, but one of the things that really I took away from your your lighting in your films is always so realistic. And one of the things that I thought about Blade Runner was that it allowed you to use more impressionistic lighting or more artistic lighting, experimental, if you will, in this in some of the scenes. Um, was that like something really exciting for you on that project? Yeah, no, that was actually it was a big uh, a big thing about that project for me. Yeah, it gave me sort of the latitude to sort of play with lighting and do some setups that I'd only done in small situations previously. Yeah, it's just a much larger canvas. Yeah, you don't often get that sort of opportunity on a film because, well, especially I don't because the kind of films I like to do are much more character driven than they are big showy kind of action movies or anything like that so this film although it's not a big action film it, it had large sets and it had a, a scope that I uh, more than probably anything I've done for a long long time right I, one of the things was some of the shots are so breathtaking like I, I was I could pause them on blu-ray and just examine the canvas and just be so amazed at the different lighting setups and the, the colors. Um, how much, if you don't mind me asking, how much of that was all pre-planned and in pre-vis or just you storyboarding and how much are those things found in the moment each day? Uh, we storyboarded it quite a bit. I mean, Denny and I storyboarded the film over a couple of months. I was in Montreal staying in a hotel. Um, every, uh, he was cutting uh, uh, his previous film and uh, every afternoon he'd come around and we'd just do storyboards. But, I mean, in front of the lighting, that was something I made up in pre-production discussion with the designer. And, uh, no, everything was very well, very detailedly planned out because it had to be. Because a lot of the sets you only see on for, like, short scenes or for one scene and maybe, a, you know, six-minute scene. But it's only a single scene but it required a certain kind of lighting. And that had to be pre-planned and pre-rigged like weeks in advance of the day of the shoot. So, I mean, all the way through the shoot, I was working at weekends and looking at the lighting and getting everything prepared for the, you know, the week's actual shooting. Um, if, you, if you don't mind me, with, uh, I'm gonna indulge me in one more question. When you think back on making that film, was there a shot or two that you still can't believe you were able to pull off? No, I don't. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't really think it like that. I think every shot's like that, really. No, I, I mean a film is something that you don't want any shot to be kind of outside of all the others in a way. You know, you want everything to sort of feel as a piece. You, I, I don't like it, and obviously people do. They say, "Oh, that shot. How did you like that?" or something. In a way, in a way, that's my failure because you shouldn't really nothing should specifically stand out you're trying to put the audience in a world that they're immersed in and everything should flow as a piece you know you understand what i mean completely but how do you feel though because what's interesting about this, i love a long oneer where you know i think about goodfellas and i think about that long shot through the dining room or i think about atonement and um so i guess what i'm saying is do you think that those kind of shots sort of add a sort of sense of suspense or something or do you know what I mean? Well it did but you have to judge when you use a long single shot or where you cut. I mean Blade Runner was, was in general a much more sort of cerebral piece of work. You know if I, li if I liken it to anything it was much more like you know Tarkovsky's Solaris. 
in a sense that you know you don't want to have big ostent ostentatious camera moves and stuff it's it's much more what's happening within the frame it's a more subtle thing than that really i think anyway but whether that comes out in the result i don't know that but that's where I kind of come from in a way. Sure. I think there's times to move the camera, there's times to follow a character, and there's times to stay back and allow that character to you know, observe that, the audience to observe that character within the space. You know what I mean? I mean, 100%. you don't always want to be wandering around with a steady cam. Uh, you know, sometimes it's actually a distraction, sometimes it would be stronger. Just see, keep this camera static on a wide shot. You know, sometimes it'd be better the actor sat down and you just looked at his face instead of he's wandering around all these wonderful locations. That's the balance, you know, that's, sure. the, that's the trick. How often have you composed a shot through your career and had it like a, you have the, an actor sitting on the couch, you have everything set up, you filmed a take or two and you realize, okay, this is just not working at all. We need to rechange this completely. Uh, not rechange it completely, but uh, quite often a director and I, we've kind of looked at it and go, you know, we're missing a trick here. We don't need to do that. We can come over here and just play it static over here and let the person do that. We don't need to see them. Or, you know, I, the, I've only ever once gone to a director, and this was with Joel and Ethan on uh, Hud Cycle Proxy, and it was like I was struggling to light this set. And... Uh, I went to them about 11 o'clock in the morning and said, look, I'm sorry, I've got to change this all completely. I, I want to start again. And they said, well, okay, we'll break for lunch early. And, and that's what we did. And then in the afternoon, it was fine. That's the only time I've ever changed something completely because I didn't like it. I usually, I, I do a lot of preparation and, and, and usually you go to a plan. But shots, yes, you can change shots sure. a lot. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating uh, learning about you, and I think I, mentioned, I talked to you about this maybe with prisoners or, or previously, is that you often, mo I guess most of the time, you, you, you don't do a lot of coverage. You have one camera on set and you, you shoot it and that's it. So I guess my question is, when was the last time you did extensive coverage on a movie? Uh, do you, I guess let me start with that. I uh, don't think I ever have really. I mean, maybe a film I didn't enjoy being on, Air America. But, um, no, I haven't really been on a film I've done extensive coverage. Uh, Air America was the only film I've been on where I've done a dialogue scene with more than two or three cameras. Um, usually I just do it, shoot everything with one camera and I'll operate myself. Um, yeah, you can only put one shot on a screen at a time unless you're doing something fancy. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I just can't get my head around shooting something with multiple cameras. It seems such a compromise. So, so uh, let me ask you this. Like with Goldfinch, let's jump into that real quick. Yeah, you um, should do. Right, no, I, I was getting there. <laughs> but with Goldfinch, you have, for, for example, certain scenes where you have, uh, you know, you, you have two actors, two people talking, and you have one shot on this actor, one shot on, on, on this actor, and it's cutting back and forth. How are you typically shooting something like that? Are you, so you're shooting... Um, you know, can you describe how you would shoot something like that? Just shooting one coverage one way first and then doing a reverse second. So it's, it's so John's actually concentrate, concentrating on the performance of a particular actor. It's intense conversation. I mean, I have a, an occasion like, for instance, on Dead Man Walking, we were doing some very intense scenes with uh, Sean and Susan in, in a jail cell oh, between the bars. And it was like a lot of it what they were doing was intense and ad libbing. And then I did use two cameras to shoot, the, you know, shoot two overs because it would be really almost impossible to match that kind of performance from one to another. But usually it's a director's preference to have a single camera and concentrate on a single performance. Got it. You obviously, I'm sure you get asked by many filmmakers to do many projects. What was it about Goldfinch that said, I want to do this project? Oh, I mean, it, just the whole story, the book. I mean, the films, the projects I like to be involved on are sort of character-driven pieces, and this was, you know, to the nth degree, a character-driven piece, you know? Completely. Um, it, 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 and, and, yeah, so that's what drew me to it. There's not that many of them, sadly. Well, they're harder and harder. Uh, yeah. To, yeah, it's... Uh, I, have you... Have you... What... Uh, I was going to say, it seems like uh, at the theaters nowadays, it's more and more escapist fare. You know? Yeah, it is, definitely. 
Yeah, um, so one of the things, one of the powerful sequences in the film is the, the, the bombing sequence in the museum um, and the way it's building and the way it's flashed back to. Could you talk about uh, filming that sequence and you know, how you and John discussed the way it was going to look? Yeah, and I mean, that was obviously key to the whole story. It's, it's the one event in, the, in Theo's life that leads to everything else in his life. Um, yeah, we discussed that a lot. I mean, and John was very keen that the aftermath was kind of like a void, you know, which is kind of a difficult thing to do technically if you don't, don't have a huge space. And obviously the set we had matched the actual real location. So the size of the gallery was of a specific size so then to make the aftermath feel like it was like huge beyond you know that this little kid is standing up in the middle of nowhere and then that was the challenge but that's that was what we were trying to get to in terms of the flashbacks to it we didn't want it to be a big kind of actiony sort of feeling to the scene we didn't want to be you know, a big explosion, see the building, all this sort of stuff. We wanted it. Now, what, I mean, what do you remember of anything that's traumatic in your life? I mean, I know I remember details. I remember little things. And that's what we sort of concentrated on. The idea of Theo's memory is this, the mother walking away out of focus or her hand leaving his shoulder or the, the, the musical instrument case, case just disappearing out of Pippa's hands. You know, as those little things that I think I think that's what truth is. That's what sticks in your mind somehow. Sure, completely. You know? yeah. how, when, how do you typically, do you ever, when you, okay, you're filming, obviously, Goldfinch, how do you look at, do you ever make requests of the director in terms of when you want to schedule something to be shot in the production? Like, do you find that, you know, like the bombing sequence, you want to get to it midway through the shoot or you want to get to it right at the beginning? Not, not so often in terms of the overall schedule. I do that a lot in terms of when I want to shoot, uh, what time of day I want to shoot a scene or something like that. Or then we talk about logistics in a schedule because, you know, you can't, or oh, it's very hard to put a lot of difficult sets and complicated lighting bussing up against each other. So you want to kind of have some pre-light time, you know, that kind of sure. stuff. But in terms of whether you put a scene like that up front or no it dictated itself in a way in our schedule when we did the museum because we had we had to do the actual last scene of the film which is Theo and his mother in the museum looking at the paintings before we did the explosion because that's the way we had a set and then we had to destroy it so you know it it it, it had it had its own built-in schedule for it in a way you know because sure. we were in new york for a certain time then we went to amsterdam and then we went to albuquerque so you know you can't you can't go to albuquerque and then come back to new york it's well just, well you can it's just very can, expensive, expensive. It's this very, was not a very you know it sure. wasn't a big budget movie because it was uh, yeah i i understand completely um one of the thing uh i'm just did you know, did John tell you what he was thinking about with the editing process of what he was going to have the film, final film look like with the edit in terms of going back and forth and, you know, and how did that possibly impact the look of any parts of the film? Well, he did, but in not so much specifically because he was saying, I mean, we knew the, the whole thing being a bookend that was in the script. But he knew he wanted more of the uh, aftermath of the explosion because he knew he wanted to go back and forth with those elements during the film, but he had ideas where that would go, but it wasn't that specific, and that was something he knew he'd get into the cutting room, and he wanted the options there. Yeah. Sure. Um, you, are, you obviously have two different time periods in the film. How did you and John talk about the look of each of the time periods, and if you wanted them to be similar, to be a little different, um, if you could talk about that no the time period not so much photographically I mean not in terms of anything you're doing with a camera or the lens I mean what was important to get the difference between the locations so you are you you know you Amsterdam wanted its own particular look as opposed to New York and then obviously uh, Las Vegas which we did in Albuquerque that wanted a, a, a totally different look again you know the kind of that hostile light of uh, of, of that uh, nature, you know. Uh, what kind of cameras did you use on Goldfinch? And has it been the, the same camera you've been using for a while? 
Yeah, I mean, I've been using the Alexa digital camera, uh, which I've been using now since in time, yeah. I've, I've done one film on film since then, which was Hell Caesar, but yeah, it's just, this is the same camera I was using on uh, Skyfall, for instance, you, and Blade Runner. Do, do you have your own set of lenses at this point, or are you no. renting based on the film? No, actually, I, uh, I've used the same set of lenses. Well, not actually the same set of lenses, the same make of lenses now for since they came out, which I guess is a few years, four or five years ago. I tend to use the same equipment. I mean, I do, when new, new, a new set of lenses is developed, I'm often involved in testing them before they come out. And if there's something I think are better than the last ones, then I start using those and when, wait for the next lens. I'm not somebody that goes, oh, well, this film, I'm going to use this sort of lens and this film, I'm going to use that sort of lens. You know, I don't, I don't swap between different kind of old lenses sure. that with their coating gone and all that stuff I'm I'm not there actually are you looking forward to seeing this is a, I wasn't going to ask this but are you, you are you looking forward to seeing the lighthouse because they use, I am yeah because I, I saw it the other day and it's it visually is unlike anything that's been made well I thought which was as well I thought that was an extraordinary piece of work I thought yeah. that was really stunning I mean I don't often gravitate towards that kind of horror film but that was so well done which so I, yeah I'm really looking forward to Lighthouse yeah. yeah the way he uses very old cameras and old lenses and it achieves a very very unique effect yeah yeah, yeah. You know? well um, there's certain times there are certain times I mean I just didn't go Goldfinch one I mean when we did Jesse James I took these lenses manufactured lenses specifically for that film so I'm not against using different kind of you know a different technique technical techniques and a different kind of lenses and manipulating the image i manipulated the image on no brother well out there but it depends on the film i'm not going to no, do that really. on something like goldfinch which actually you want to immerse it's a it's a character film and you want to immerse the audience in the characters and you don't want them to be aware of the surface you're not trying to tell them now we're in a period film, this is an old film, or this is going to be scary. You know what I mean? It's like... Completely. You well, don't want to think I about have, it. I have, listen, I love Jesse James. That film is brilliant. Um, what will it take to get that film released on Criterion? I don't know. It should be. I would really like to see the long version, the first cut that I saw released on Criterion. That's what I'd hope uh, for. Can I ask how long that one was? Um, it was over three hours. But I mean, I don't think it ever will because Andrew, last time I talked to him, which was some time ago now, about it, he, he was quite happy with the version that got released. But I still remember that first, the f early cut that I saw that was like three and a quarter, I think. And I, I thought it was, no, maybe it was longer than that, but I thought it was pretty stunning. <laughs> I, I it think was a four hour version. The first cut was like four hours. I, I seem to remember. I, I have to tell you, I think that he captured something. You, the, together mm. you guys captured something amazing and i would pay good money to see any longer version yeah. of that film well i think i agree i mean i think what he got was the book if you ever read the book uh hansen's book it, it has that sort of mythical kind of poetic feeling about it the feeling you know a kind of peck and bow feeling of something passing you know, the world changing and these characters being kind of left behind by the world. No, he, <laughs> Which I think I'm feeling myself right now. <laughs> um, no, I refuse to accept that. And, uh, but no, I think, I think he's, a, he's a very gifted filmmaker and that, that film just has magic on it. It's just a great piece of work. But um, I have to ask, are, are you a little bummed you couldn't shoot Dune? Um, well, of course, of course. But then on the other hand, I can't say that because I'm so, so proud and happy to shoot with Sam Mendes again. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, what can you do? Yeah. I, was, I was actually, I was so pleased he asked me because I didn't do the Bond with him, the last Bond film with him. And I was very pleased he asked me back to do 1917 because if there was ever a film that I felt have my name on it. It was that film. <laughs> um, I am. Uh, I. I'm, I don't want to ask you about the film because I know they're being guarded with everything. But you I'll, can ask. I won't say anything. But. Right. Exactly. No. I'm just going to be. Uh, I'll just ask you. Where are you? Did you guys rap? Where are you in the post production process? Oh no. Yeah, process? we rap. We rap. Yeah. No. We rapped. Um, I'm going to be timing it um, early October, I think, mid October, something like that. Um, I know it has a December release date. 
Christmas Day, I believe. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, when do you think you guys will have a finished version of that film that people can actually see? Oh, I don't know. You'll have to ask. Is studio. it going to be cutting it close? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. No, I don't see why it would. I mean, no. Okay, so I you think so. I think it's all going to be. No, it's all going to be on schedule and fine. But I just don't know when they're planning to start sure. showing it. You've done Bond. You've done Blade Runner. You've worked in. You've worked with so many different things. Is there a current franchise or filmmaker out there that you're like that you would love to work on or work with, or does it sort of not work like that with you? Uh, there is, but it doesn't work like that anyway, does it? I mean, you know, y yeah, you know, the f so many filmers have, have the crews they work with, and that's the way it is, you know. Sure. Sometimes you get lucky, yeah. Could, what is it going to take for me to get you and Chris McQuarrie together to make Mission Impossible, <laughs> or to film a Mission Impossible? Uh, that, sorry, it'll never happen. I don't, I don't like those movies. It's a terrible so thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> I love Chris McQuarrie, but I've, sure. I've talked I, I, to him about that. By the way, that. I appreciate people that actually uh, say the truth and don't try to sugarcoat, like, oh, I love it, but do you know what I mean? No, I mean, I just, sorry. No, no, it, it's fine. Um, do you know what you're going to do next after? No, so if anybody's got a project, I'm really looking for something. <gasps> right. I... For some reason, I don't think it'll be hard for you to get a job. I don't know. It's I don't know. Please, I, I like I, I appreciate be, the humbleness, but my God, I'm sure that there's about ten filmmakers that would scream. You know. Well, uh, put this out there because I don't know right now. Uh, okay, I'll leave it there. My my last thing for you. Uh, I love. Uh, um, what do you think? You, you're working with the Alexa camera. I love when technology is able to help the creative process. What do you think there is coming? In, with technology that maybe will be able to accomplish something you haven't been able to accomplish, if anything. Uh, well, I think I think the big development now is is because the, the size of the cameras are becoming smaller and smaller. The big development is gimbals and how you can move the camera. I mean, I think that's going to have a huge effect. It already is having a huge effect on films. Um, but it will be rather like when Steadicam first came out, everybody sort of put the camera on the Steadicam and will sort of wander around and call it filmmaking. It's, it's not, it's another tool and it's been overused and it'll say, the same thing will happen with gimbals and small cameras, you know, once, once we, you know, Hollywood starts shooting films like, you know, guys going around with their little, you know, home videos, sure. which is what we'll be doing then that style will be rampant, but it will be so boring. And then somebody will do something like Andrei Tarkovsky and put the camera there and go like that, and they'll go, oh my God, or like something like a Bresson movie, and they'll go, oh my God, that's revolutionary. My, my last thing for you, because I know I gotta go. Um, what do you think, about, right now I've seen a lot of shots, uh, uh, not in fi major films, but I've seen a lot of shots on YouTube and other places where people are using drones to achieve shots that have never been done in cinema history or in movies. How do you feel about like drones and do you s foresee them being used by yourself or other filmmakers in films? Yeah, I mean, I've used drones, but you've got to ask yourself why. That's the thing. It's the same as Steadicam. Okay, it's a tool, but why? It's not just because you use it. Because you got it, you don't use it. You've got to say, why do I want to use it? Is that really the way I want to communicate that part of the story? Sure. You know? um, listen, I could talk to you for another three hours, but yeah. I know you have to go do other interviews. Yeah. Uh, again, I really exactly. sincerely say thank you so much. Your work in Goldfinch, as all your other work, is fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to Nordstrom Canada for letting us uh, be at, at, uh, at Toronto, the Toronto Film Festival. Thank you so much, sir. Bye.